Please turn in your copy of the Word of God to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read 9 verses. Ezekiel 33. And if you would stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Ezekiel 33. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to your people. Now I want to pause real briefly because some of the Hebrew rendering of this says, Speak to the sons of your people. Which to me is an indication that one of two things is going on. Either these people that are in exile that Ezekiel is speaking to, God knows they're a lost cause. Or, more likely, God is saying, you know what, you're going to be in exile all your life. So this message is for your children because you're never going to have an opportunity to be in your land and you're never going to have an opportunity to stand to watch. So I continue, son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman and he sees the sword coming upon the land and he blows on the trumpet and warns the people then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, I want to point this out. This is a very important part of this verse. A person. It doesn't say that the, the sword comes and takes a group of people, a bunch of people, a nation. One person. The Lord values every person. If the sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. You will hear a message from my mouth and will give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked of his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you, on your part, warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word endures. 3,000 years 2,000 years, a 1,000 years ago, Lord, as your word got lost, we see what happened. Father, I pray your word will not get lost today. Father, open our eyes and our hearts to your word. Yeah. Remove me from this place. Speak through me. May you be blessed, and may the reading of your word be blessed in spite of me. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, the, this concept of a watchman... It's not a new concept. It's been around for as long as mankind have been around. I'm sure back in Adam's day, they set the night watch to warn of marauders, to warn of wild beasts. And even today, on the other side of the world, it's 11 at night. Even today, there are people sitting on night watch. Those of you who have been in the military, and I look across this congregation, I'm imagining it's more than a couple of you, have probably set the night watch. And you remember that passage of scripture that I read earlier from Psalm 130. That my soul hopes in you like the night watchman's soul longs for the morning. Those of you who have set the night watch, those of you who have worked the mid-shift, you know what that's like. You can't wait for daybreak. You know, I had a friend of mine whose father was a radar operator on an AWACS airplane. And most of you know what an AWACS looks like, even though you don't think you do. It was the radar aircraft, the Boeing 707, that had the big disc on the top of it that spun around with a white stripe, black disc with a white stripe on it. He was a radar operator, and his job was to look out for the enemy. If he was flying around Alaska, he could see the bear bombers making these mock runs to attack the U.S., trial runs. He could see them over the horizon. If he was down in Cuba, he could watch the fighter jets come out of Cuba as I tested our defenses. He was a watchman. My job in the military, I've been in the military 26 years, my job in the military is I'm a meteorologist. Traditionally, meteorology is placed in the intelligence division of the military because meteorology is very important. We have a motto in weather, it's choose the weather for battle. You don't want to go out and fight the enemy when you can't see and he can't see. You want to go out and fight the enemy when you can see and he can't. But one of my other jobs is that of what we call an OPSEC manager, operation security. It's kind of a reverse watchman. 
Because what I do is I look for vulnerabilities. I look for holes in the fence, so to speak. My job as an OPSEC manager is to go around and look at, okay, if I were an enemy, if I were a bad guy, where would I come in and exploit this weakness? Where would I surprise you? And all throughout history, wars have been won and battles have been won through surprise attack. As a matter of fact, surprise is important. Famous Chinese tactician Sun Tzu in his Art of War said this, Conflict, direct confrontation will lead to engagement and surprise will lead to victory. That is why we as a nation spend so much money on intelligence gathering. That's why we send $100 million satellites in orbit to keep an eye on people. What we do today with technology Back in Ezekiel's day, they did with eyes and a trumpet. Now, God compared Ezekiel's job to that of a watchman. He told him, you're a watchman. And if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 3, we see Ezekiel there with about 10,000 exiles. The first exiles out of Judah. They're sitting at the Kabar River. And it's actually a canal that the Babylonians dug. And it's between the Euphrates and the Tigris River. And he's sitting there with these guys. The first 10,000 exiles that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of Judah. And there's such depression there and such overwhelming sense of loss at what had happened to them that there was silence for seven days, the Word of God says in Ezekiel chapter 3. But God also says that your face is hard against their face and their face is hard against yours. And what God is saying is, you know what? They aren't going to listen to you. But don't feel bad. They didn't listen to me. You're not alone. But just in case... You waver. It says down there in verse 9, I've made your forehead as hard as flint. In other words, I've made you as hard-headed as they are. Because I want you to know that being a watchman requires stubbornness. It requires perseverance. And it requires being hard-headed. When we get into 33, Ezekiel 33, which is our passage of Scripture here, it gets a little bit more philosophical. And we see that it applies not only to Ezekiel, this concept of being a watchman, but it applies to anyone who the Lord appoints. That means it applies to Ezekiel. That means it applies to you, brother. That means it applies to you, sister. It applies to you. You have been appointed a watchman. And this is what I want to talk about today. I don't want to talk about being a radar technician on an AWACS aircraft. I don't want to talk about being a meteorologist. I don't want to talk about being an OPSEC manager, and I don't want to talk about standing a night watch. You and I are watchmen of the Lord. And that is the title of this message today, is The Watchman. So what are we watchmen of? First of all, as followers of Christ, we are watchmen for the nation. Now notice I said the term followers of Christ. We are called Christians today in this land. And in Scripture... They're called followers of Christ or they're called Christians. I have found that the term Christian is so overused, especially in the Bible Belt. So much so that if you go work church plants up north, Portland area, Seattle area, they don't even use the term Christian because it's got such a bad name to it. They use the term follower of Christ because being a follower of Christ is someone who has said yes to Jesus. And it's just not wearing Christianity as a label. But I want to tell you today that this message is for both of you, the Christians and the non-Christians. There's a little bit of something in here for everyone. Verse 2, where it says, And if the, the people of the land, where it says, If I bring a sword upon the land and the people of that land, I want you to know that specifically this is talking about Judah. This is talking about Ezekiel's people, the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, which has split off from Israel. But I want you to understand that this applies to us today. This applies to America. Because listen to this. From Psalm 127, 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor to build it are laboring in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And as I head into the heart of this message, I want to lay out a premise to you this morning. Before the, the foundation that everything is going to rest, and that is that the Lord built this country. Amen. That God ordained this country Amen. in its beginnings. And that this nation was founded by the Lord for His purposes. For indeed the Lord is over all the kingdoms of the earth. Amen. No king rises, no king rests his eyes without the Lord's ordination. And just as Israel was dedicated to the God of heaven, so was this nation dedicated to the God of heaven. Because at the very site of Ground Zero, St. Paul's Chapel, George Washington and the Founding Fathers 
dedicated this country to God, and in fact, George Washington himself said, no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of man more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they advance to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. George Washington has said, every step that we have taken in founding this country has been done by the hand of Almighty God. Amen. Andrew Jackson said, the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. Patrick Henry said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thomas Jefferson said, Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? And the answer to that question is no, it cannot be. A nation cannot survive when we forget that a liberty, our liberty as a people, our liberty as a free nation are a gift of Almighty God. Guided by His providence directed by his hand. This is a history that is being systematically erased today. Systematically forgotten today. It is being erased from our public school classrooms. It is being glossed over in our college lecture halls. It is being ignored in our corporate boardrooms. It is being mocked in our political offices and in our homes. We don't even acknowledge it. We have truly forgotten that our liberties are a gift of God. Jefferson was indeed correct when he said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a sword coming upon this land. If you do not understand that, then I implore you to wake up. There is a sword coming upon this land. It's someday, it's one day, and in the famous words of R.G. Lee, there's a payday someday. Payday someday is written into the Constitution of God's universe, he says. The retributive providence of God is a reality as certain as the laws of gravitation are reality. As sure as the gravity holds me down, so is the providential hand of God and as sure is the divine retribution of God against sin. Just as sure as I cannot float, so God will judge sin. There's a sword coming to this country the sword of God's justice, and we deserve it. It's coming for the same reasons that it came to Israel. If you do not understand why it came to Israel, I implore you to read the book of Amos. I implore you to read the book of Isaiah. I implore you to read the books of Jeremiah and Hosea. And you will come away with the understanding of why God is judging Israel and why he must judge America. He has no choice, ladies and gentlemen. He has no other option. Because God is about holiness. God is about justice. God is a merciful, loving, kind. If he counted iniquity, who could stand? But God is a God of wrath against sin. If you think that you are hiding your sin from an almighty God, and you are looking for some other way other than Jesus Christ to get you out of that, the wrath of God remains on you. And that is your message as a watchman. Now, there are so many reasons, and I cannot even begin to go into it, but I'm going to touch on a few. And I will say right now, what I say could be possibly offensive to some of you here. I have a feeling most of you are going to agree with me, but if it's offensive to you, let me say this. I don't care. Amen. Okay? I really don't. The prophet is never popular, not even in his hometown. Amen. Abortion. Can there be any more abhorrent act on the planet than the execution of the innocent? It is beyond comprehension to me as I ponder it. And yet politicians and activists line up to sing its praises, and some even put in catheters and wear tennis shoes for 11 hours to defend its use. And if that's not sad enough, people line up and make those people a hero. Let me put this evil into context. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Let me read some quotes to you from Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. I want everybody to Let me put this evil into context. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Let me read some quotes to you 
from Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. I want everybody to understand who we're dealing with. She said the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Birth control must ultimately lead to a cleaner race. Birth control must ultimately lead to a cleaner race. And when she was talking about birth control, she wasn't talking about the pill. Because when she said this, the pill hadn't been invented yet. She was talking about abortion. So if you're not just real clear on what she stood for, let me really spell it out. We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out the idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. This is the hero of the pro-choice movement. A genocidal maniac. Someone who believed in a clean, white race. Who does this sound like to you? Hitler. Hitler. You know, I've asked that question before, and there is no hesitation. But yet, she is a hero. And guess what? She was very successful. Planned Parenthood operates about 70% of their clinics within the inner city. To date, about 50 million children have been killed. Not necessarily in its doors, but through the use of abortion. She's a hero. She did what she promised. And now today, there are politicians and activists and black ministers that line up and usher in the right to exterminate their own race. That is how blinding sin is, ladies and gentlemen. I need you to understand the heart of evil. The, the heart is deceptively wicked above all things. Who can know it, the prophet says. You need to understand that when that heart is so deceived, can anyone who condones or supports such an act have any moral foundation at all? If they are so wrong about this, how can they be trusted? And I'm talking about politicians here. How can they be trusted if they're so wrong about this? How can they be trusted to make other wise decisions when this is so clear? It doesn't get any clearer. But if you're so morally bankrupt that this is okay, how can you be trusted to make a wise decision? That is why I will never vote for a Democrat or Republican or Independent or Libertarian or purple, green, and yellow party. I don't care if they support the idea of abortion or a woman's right to choose. Ladies and gentlemen, just as in the days of Israel when they sacrificed their children to Moloch in the fire, so are children today being sacrificed to the God of convenience so that they do not have to face the responsibility of their actions. You need to understand that you are watchmen. You are watchmen. The sword is coming to this land because of our wickedness. You have heard the voice of the Lord. You want to hear the voice of the Lord? Read His Word. You want to hear it out loud? Read it out loud. That's the voice of the Lord. And He is saying that the sword is coming to the land. There's been a wholesale movement away from God. There's been a wholesale movement away from the things of God. And the reason to visit us for our sin and give us justice is much too, too, there's too many to mention. It's not just abortion. It's a culture of immorality that has gripped us. I'm not going to condemn the homosexuals. I will condemn homosexuality. But let me explain why. Sinners do what sinners do. A pastor of mine growing up, he always said, you know, there's this little old farmer, and he had a pig, and he loved this little old pig, and he used to dress a little old pig up. He, he painted her toenails. He put some perfume on her, and he put her on the ground, and she'd run right back to the, to the waller in the mud. Why, little old pig? Why? Because she's a pig. Sinners do what sinners do. And let me, let me break some news to you. It doesn't matter whether your sin is homosexuality or fornication, gossip or murder. It is enough to separate you from the love of God apart from the redemption found in Jesus Christ. Amen. It doesn't matter. If you are in a homosexual lifestyle, an adulterous lifestyle... And you don't have Christ? Those other things are the least of your worries. We have a bigger problem here. And it's not just the fact that the nation and the senses of our nation have been dulled. Main Street America is streaming. We're streaming headlong into the rejection of biblical Christianity. But there's a movement abroad to normalize all sorts of deviant sex acts. There's a movement abroad to accept everybody's morality as their own. 
Everybody has their own moral code. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes, and there's nothing new under the sun, the preacher said. Ladies and gentlemen, you're a watchman. The Lord commands you to use your voice like a trumpet. I think of all these things that bother me. I think there's none other that bothers me more than apathy. Apathy that I see everywhere. I see it in the church. So-called very conservative people, very strong Christian people. They don't care. Ladies and gentlemen, we are facing a loss of freedoms in this country, not faced since 1776. Ladies and gentlemen, we are facing financial issues in this country never seen before. Finances that will cause people to say a quart of wheat for a day's wages, three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and hurt not the oil and the wine. Famine so deep that those who lived through the Great Depression have never seen anything like it. Apathy comes in all forms. But there's two main forms that it comes in. One of them is not caring at all, and another is not caring about the right things. Just not caring about the right things. You have seen it, I'm sure, in your children, your grandchildren. The children have become the planets around which the parents orbit. They have become so, their lives are so full of stuff, and that is to me the greatest deception going, the need to be busy all the time. It takes away people, people's time to pray, People's time to spend before the Lord. And people's time just to be a family. Because they're busy. They're always going, going, going. And it causes them not to care about the things that are important. But you say, oh, but I'm a, I'm a little league coach. Or I, I, I'm doing this for the community. Let me explain something to you. Uh, but, but hold on before you talk. I, I'm making, I make a difference because I'm a good example. If you are not giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ, or you are not discipling them in some way, you are no more of a moral example than a Buddhist. And in a lot of instances, you're probably worse. Because I've known Buddhists. And frankly, when it comes to being good, they're better than me. When you go before the Beaver Seat of Christ, and you've got your busy life, and you've done nothing for the kingdom, and you haven't been a watchman, all of this stuff is going to be piled before the blazing eye of God. And you are going to be frantically sifting through your life through this wood, hay, and stubble that is now a pile of ashes. And you're going to be frantically searching for some gold and some silver. And you are going to find none. None. We are watchmen. We are watchmen for this nation. But we are also personal watchmen. We are watchmen for each other. Look at verse 4. His blood, his iniquity. This is a personal connection. This is one-on-one. -on -one. This is me and you. We are to watch over fellow believers. Leaders of the church, do you know they have watch over you? Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. They have a duty. Your leaders have a duty to watch. And you have a duty to submit. And if you cannot submit to the authority that God has placed over you, then you leave. We have a duty to each other. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if any of you is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We are to help each other out in our trials and our tribulations and our sins, not in a judgmental way. And if we feel a judgmental way coming upon us, we better flee and let somebody else take it Amen. who is a little more humble. And we stand watch over the souls of men. Colossians 1.28 says this, Whom we preach... Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Warning them about what? Their lost condition. We are to warn them about their lost condition. So how do we do this? We are to listen. Ezekiel 3.17 says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth. And then in verse 2 again, we see, If he sees the sword coming to the land. So we are to listen and look. Those are using our senses, but we have to be sensitive to the Spirit, sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. We have to be modern-day men of Issachar, who the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 32, he said, have an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We cannot keep our head in the sand. We have to look at our world. We have to see what's going on around us. We have to contemplate what it means, and we have to warn, because it says in Ezekiel 3, verse 17, it says, and when you hear the word... You shall give them warning from me. And in verse 3 it says you will sound the trumpet. The watchman sounds the trumpet. Our understanding and our perceptions of what's going on in this world sometimes are not our failures. It's our application of it. We know. 
But we're afraid to be called bigoted. We're afraid to be called homophobic. We are afraid to be called intolerant. Amen. We're afraid of what they're going to say about us. Well, what are the church people are going to say about me? What are my friends going to say about me? My family may not speak to me. Our application of this is what is important. It, you see, the Bible doesn't say, and God didn't say to Ezekiel, when you hear it and you see it, stop. You've got to put feet to your faith. You've got to do something with it. You can't sit idly by. And for too long, we as a church have sat idly by. We have sat by and watched our country fail. We have sat by and watched immorality rise without saying anything. We have sat by and watched countless millions of children die. And we're too afraid to open our voices and shout a trumpet of warning. Judgment is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, judgment is coming. You have to disagree sometimes. You have to disagree with boldness. It takes boldness to blow a trumpet and wake everybody up in the middle of the night. It takes boldness to say, you are doing wrong. It takes boldness to say, you are dead in your sins. And you will face the wrath of a holy God unless you repent and believe. Amen. That takes boldness. It takes courage. And sometimes we have to disagree with people without being disagreeable. We have to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading. But listen to what A.W. Tozer said, a great man of God. When pleasing man means displeasing God, it is an unqualified evil that should have no place in the Christian's heart. To be right with God has often meant to be in trouble with men. This is such a common truth that one hesitates to mention it. Yet it appears to have been overlooked by the majority of Christians today. And this was written about 60 years ago, maybe 70 there is a notion abroad that to win a man, we must agree with him. Actually, the exact opposite is true. The man who is going in the wrong direction will never be set right by the affable religionist who falls in step beside him and goes the same way. Someone must place himself across the path and insist that the strained men turn around and go the other direction. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to... You have to place yourself in that path. And sometimes placing yourself in a path means you're going to be stepped on. It means people are going to walk on you and it's going to hurt. But in order to get people to turn around and go the other way, you have to put yourself in their path. You can't hold their hand and go, well, yeah, I just think of a different way. Because that leads them to destruction. You need to understand that negligence on your part as a watchman. Now this is where the rubber meets the road, big boy, as my pastor used to say. <coughs> this is where the rubber meets the road. You need to understand that negligence on your part has consequences. Remember what I read back in verse 6? If a person. Negligence on our part has consequences. Verse 6 says that the watchman sees the sword coming and doesn't blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned. And the sword comes and takes any one of them away. That person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the whose? <coughs> Say it again. Watchmen. Watchmen. I want to make sure you're awake. If you're asleep in one of my messages, I don't know how. I want some of what you're taking. I will require at the watchman's hand. Dare not I ask how much blood is on my hand because of my silence. I don't want to know, but I don't I'll know someday. I don't want to see it. I don't want to face it. How much blood will be required at my hand? Because I sat idly by, I sat silent, I shook my head in disgust, but kept my lips closed. I didn't sound the trumpet. Their blood is required on me. And all my silence has bought me is a temporary reprieve, and it's bought me blood guilt. And dare I say the same for you? Dare I say the same for all of us? All I can tell you is that I'm not going to remain silent any longer. I'm not going to sit by and watch the country that I love, the country that I have fought for. I am not going to sit by and watch us commit national suicide without uttering a word. National suicide, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're doing. What about you? What about you? I'm asking, this is not a rhetorical question, and I don't need an audible response, but I need you to think about it. What about you? What are you going to do with today's message? What are you going to do with Ezekiel? What are you going to do one day when the Lord requires blood at your hand? And he says, you know, there was that crazy old bald-headed fat guy that, that came <laughs> and he said, something about a watchman. Do you remember that, brother, bro, sister? And you're going to be forced to say yes. What did you do with it? Nothing. Because you're afraid of being called a bigot? You're afraid of being called this name or that name? 
Ladies and gentlemen, if that's what you're afraid of, then you will never handle real persecution. This is what passes as Christianity today. This passivity, this meekness without boldness. I think what sums it up better than anything is 1 Corinthians 16, 13, where it says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. That's what the apostle says. Be strong. In a world, in a culture that wants to emasculate men at every turn, in a culture that tells us to be sensitive and tolerant, the Apostle Paul says, act like a man. You know, and when I first looked this passage up and really studied it, it is what it says it is. It's not some euphemism, some hidden little... It means act like a man. Suck it up. Drive on. Quit your boohooing. Grow a spine. Stand up straight. Be the warrior. That's Paul's advice to you. That's what he's imploring you to do, and that's what I am doing today, is to be strong and act like a man. As I get near my clothes, I'm reminded of my wife's favorite movie, A Few Good Men. And Colonel Jessup is on the stand, Jack Nicholson, and I will butcher this, because I'm no Jack Nicholson, otherwise I probably wouldn't be preaching, I would be acting. Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg, I have a greater responsibility than you can fathom. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom which I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just smiled and said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand at post. Ladies and gentlemen, you are a watchman. You are the guardian of freedom in Christ. If they don't hear the warning from you, they will never hear the warning. We are his mouth. We are his trumpet. We are to tell them about freedom that is in the gospel and repentance into a nation that has turned its back on God at an ever-increasing pace. You are a watchman. Today he is commanding you to speak with boldness. And I am imploring you. And God is commanding you to pick up a weapon and to stand a post. Pick up a weapon today and stand a post. The sword of the Lord is your weapon. Pick it up. Stand your ground. Act like men. You can do it. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God by the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of Christ and being every, bringing every thought into that, the obedience of Christ. Amen. The weapons of your warfare are prayer. They are reading the Word of God and they are fasting. Those are your weapons. Pick up a weapon and stand your post. I said earlier that I like the term followers of Christ rather than Christians because... Frankly, there are probably, if, if surveys are true, and they usually are, there's probably one or more of you in here that if the trumpet were to sound and the church of Jesus were to be called home, there's one or more of you that would probably be left sitting. And so I would be a negligent watchman if I did not tell you today how you can remedy your sickness that will kill you. And I hope you understand that hanging out in a church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like going to a donut shop doesn't make you a cop. <laughs> Salvation is not some intellectual exercise. It's not some idea or knowledge or even belief that Jesus existed and God exists. Or that Jesus even exists today. That's not salvation. Believe it or not, the demons know that. They know it more than you do. They've seen it firsthand. And they have sense enough to tremble. What makes a believer and what makes an unbeliever is that some of us have sense enough to agree with God on the verdict of sin. Some of us have looked at sin and say, yes, Lord, it's evil, it's filthy, and I agree with you. And yet some of us have decided to disagree with God and somehow believe God isn't in a position to make a determination on what should be called right and what should be called wrong. But see, this is salvation, is the understanding of your sin, no matter how small, no matter how great, cannot be allowed into the presence of an absolute holy God. Allowing sin into the presence of holiness destroys holiness. That's the reason why this argument of, well, I'm a good person. And many of you have probably run across people that, well, why are you going to heaven? Because I'm a good person. That's why it falls flat. Because the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. Amen. There is none good, no, not one. And this argument that I'm a good person, it fails right there because you're now faced with a choice. 
Understand that all of your goodness is but filthy rags in the presence of a holy God. All of it's but filthy rags. And that you have to make that conscious decision to agree with God on His verdict of your sin. That you are undeserving of His grace and mercy. That is salvation. That is the first steps is that repentance. Godly sorrow over your sin leads to repentance. Which leads to salvation not to be repented of. Because see, if you decide you get to determine what's right and what's wrong, then what you have really said is that 7 billion other people in this world can also determine what's right and what's wrong. I wish you good luck with that when we have 7 billion people making moral arguments for their own behavior. We need to understand that we have to have the cross of Christ. Enter the cross of Christ, enter the shed blood of Jesus, who is the perfect sacrifice, the propitiation, the appeasement of wrath, for our sin. I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is a bridge. Your sin is a canyon. You cannot get to the other side without a bridge. And I dare say that none of you have ever driven over a bridge without placing faith in the one who designed it. Otherwise, you would have turned around and went the other way. It doesn't mean that you haven't driven over some bridges you weren't so sure about. It doesn't mean you weren't nervous. It doesn't mean you have. I've driven over some things and I had my doubts. There were a couple of two-by-twelves, and there was a space. I had my doubts, but I finally put my faith in the designer. Amen. You have to place your faith in the finished work of Christ today. There is no way. There is no other bridge. There aren't three bridges, five bridges, a whole bunch of bridges leading to an island. There is one bridge, and that bridge is Christ. Amen. And when you say, I place my faith in what you did, that your shed blood covers my sin, I am not deserving, but through you I am. I wear your righteousness, not my own. You're saved. Now salvation is what makes one a Christian. It's not an intellectual exercise, but one day you're going to be graded. One day, God, when you close your eyes in death, is going to say, what did you do with my son Jesus? Are you here on your own merits, or are you here on his? As we offer this time of invitation, if you're not sure, I want to give you an opportunity. But I also want you to understand that this altar is not just for salvation. This altar is for saying, I have not been the best watchman. Would you pray for me? We have sick here. This altar, in the words of James chapter 5, verse 14, is for if any of you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. This altar has many uses. Can you find one today? If you have a burden, Galatians 6 says, we're to bear one another's burdens. I'll gladly bear it with you. But most importantly, my job as a watchman implores me to make you check one more time. Are you in the faith? Do you know that you know? Are you absolutely sure? Would you stand?